to God, hello, Fort Worth, Stockyards. We're happy to be here today. Want to uh, proclaim to you the word of God. Want to share with you the everlasting gospel that brings reconciliation between man and God through Jesus Christ, the righteous. Want to start out today talking about Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Here we have the words from a preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. This man, his name is known by Solomon, and he was identified, as I said, as the son of David. He was also the third king of Israel, and he served as king around 970 to 931 BCE, just for a little background. Now, I've got something here that he preached about that relates directly to today and the position that we find ourselves in as we walk through life, as we continue to walk that path where we work, we feed our families, we come out here possibly on the weekend to enjoy ourselves. Nothing new has been seen under the sun, and so this is the message I'm going to preach to you today. I want to start out with this, verse 2. This preacher states, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanities of vanities, all is vanity. With regards to this, Mark chapter 8, 34, verse 38 says this, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, for whoever desires to save his life, will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what profit, what will it profit rather a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You see, we can continue to walk a life of vanity. That is to say, a life of meaninglessness if we take God out of our lives and we believe what we are taught in the public school system today or what we hear on the news or what this the, the most famous scientist has to tell you with regards to whatever he thinks life stemmed from know this that if we take god out of life most certainly this saying is true that all is vanity it is meaningless without god there is no hope without god there is no meaning without god there is no point of life and that is what we are here today to direct you to. That is to him who was righteous and true. To the Lamb of God who was slain on your behalf. For there is nothing that a man can give in exchange for his soul. Let's continue on with this. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him, the Son of Man, also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Brothers and sisters of humanity, I want to tell you this. Jesus Christ is not one to be ashamed of, but instead rather the ways of this wicked world that lead us down the broad path that leads to destruction. For Jesus said, narrow is the way, narrow is the path, that leads to life and he is that door he is that gatekeeper if you will that will take you down that narrow path he is god the son second person of the trinity without him we have no hope we have no salvation it is by the blood of christ that we are sanctified that we are saved it is by his works what he has done on the cross that has led us to become true believers. Mark chapter 24, 35 says this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. James chapter 4, verse 14 says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. You see, our life can be meaningless. 
as we walk, if we take God out of our life, or if we're not obedient to His commands, if we don't die to our will and instead lift up the will of the Father through Jesus Christ in us, as the Holy Spirit enables us to do, then all has become vanity, it has become pointless. We can continue to walk as we walk. We can continue to go to restaurants. We can drink that beer to get drunk. I'm not condemning you for drinking, but the Bible says that drunkards will not have their place in the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God, and we will be judged according to God's word. But understand this, even though all passes away, the word of God will by no means pass away. Glory to God and hallelujah, praise be his name. He is glorified, and when he comes back, he will be glorified in his saints, those who trust in him, those who walk faithfully in accordance to the faith. Job 9.29, this is Job's response to God. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? So if we continue to walk in wickedness, and in this uh, uh, case in point, vanity, simply meaning meaningless, what we do, our labors, our toils, how we continue in life, Everything we do is in vain without Jesus Christ. Everything is in vain if we do not submit to him and make him the Lord of our life. For it is appointed for man to die once and then comes the judgment. My friends, this is very real. When he returns, he is coming back with a fire that will encompass about him. That fire is the fire of judgment. The elements of the earth will be burned up. There are things that are coming upon this world for which we need to recognize. Because God's word says it, so it will be It will be so. God's word is truth, but in this world we find darkness. I'm asking all of you who have ears to hear to hearken unto the voice of the Lord through his revealed written word. The Holy Spirit will bear witness to your salvation if you truly repent and believe upon Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Moving on to what the preacher says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 3. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Israel fell and was subjected to the consequences of vanity and sin in Jeremiah 16, 19 as an example. Here we see Jeremiah the prophet states this, O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge, in the day of affliction the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies vanity and things wherein there is no profit let me restate that again surely our fathers have inherited lies vanity and things wherein there is no profit it's meaningless if we continue to walk according to our own selfish ways our own selfish desires if we are not willing to take up our cross, let's think about that. We don't die to our will, but instead we lift our will up and we walk arrogantly in the face of God who sent his only son to die on your behalf. That is a rejection of Jesus Christ because you are unwilling to submit and unwilling to repent and to change your wicked heart. This is why Israel fell. This is why Israel had been punished so many times. We can read it over and over in the Old Testament, especially in Jeremiah, Zechariah. We have a lot to talk about there. Romans 6, 12 through 19 seems to put vanity into perspective since when it comes down to it, vanity is not living a life for God, but instead is living for oneself. Vanity lulls us to sleep in slumber concerning what we ought to be focused on 
and to whom we should be working and living for. Romans 8 verse 1 has the same idea where it calls us to live a life, a sacrificial life, walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Going back to Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 19, this is what it says. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Understand this. If sin has dominion over you, you are walking in willful, willful sin. You are not under grace. You are under law. But if you have been freed and set free by the blood of Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, then you are under grace. As we walk in the Spirit, as the Spirit writes His law upon our hearts. Paul says this in verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? He says, certainly not. Do you not know to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave. Whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And I speak, Paul says here in human terms, because of the weakness of your flesh. So he's not even talking necessarily in spiritual terms, but in fleshly terms, in terms that these Romans can understand to all who are called to be saints. He says, For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness. I have to ask, and I have to bring this up, are we standing in the will of God? Are we walking in the way of God? Have we died to ourselves? Are we willing to heed the word or do we just continue to walk? Do we continue to go about our way thinking that, oh, I'll hear this matter another time or that I don't have time for this? Or is it that you are those that are prophesied in 1 Corinthians where Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing? So if you hear the message of the cross and you think it's foolishness, understand this, that you are indeed perishing. Ecclesiastes 1.5, getting back to the preacher here. He continues on in verse 5. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and it comes again on its circuit. So there's a pattern here that we see with the wind. He continues on, this preacher, to say that all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Men cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. You see, as we walk about in this life, we see things. We hear things. We're never satisfied. And we think that uh, by heaping up more of those things, by going after what is in this world, that we're going to fill that void. But the only one that can fill that void is Jesus the righteous. He is the only one that has the power to set you free from condemnation because He spilled His precious blood that you and I may live, that you and I may be reconciled to our Father, our Father God, who is in heaven. Amen. So the preacher here points out that all things are meaningless when God is removed 
from our lives. I'd also like to point out in Ephesians 2.10, for those of you who know Jesus, for those of you who do walk according to His way, if you love Him, you indeed obey Him. This is what He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. These works, not done in our own strength, nor for our own benefit, but are worked through us by God through His grace. You understand this is the power of the Holy Spirit making a work in us. And those good works are pleasing to God. All right, we've heard it said that, uh, uh, quoted rather, that works are as filthy rags, but we have to understand the context of that that was spoken to Israel as they were walking in lawlessness. Their works were filthy rags because they didn't have what was pleasing in them, working through them to please God. And I'm going to back this up with scripture. Hebrews 13, 21 says this, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead and that great shepherd, rather that great shepherd, excuse me, of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So if you have the power of Jesus Christ in your life, if you have the Holy Spirit working in you, transforming you, you will indeed be moved to good works, not to work for your salvation because that's impossible. It is by faith, but instead it's because of your love for God. You understand that we have become debtors, just like Paul said, he is a, a, a slave to God. So too we likewise become the same. Those works that God works through us are pleasing to Him. They, orig they originate from God. Those are not vanity. That is not pointless. It's not meaningless. But has a purpose. God has a purpose in everyone's life, but it's up to you to submit to the gospel, to repent and believe what Jesus Christ has done. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 says this, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Colossians 1.10 says that, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God of God. Are you increasing in the knowledge of God or are we increasing in the knowledge of this world? Amen. God bless you. Amen. That's what we're called to do, to submit to Him, understand the truth. As He works in us, we will mature in the faith. There will be evidence of His working in your life. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 1 Nine, The preacher continues on here, and he says this, That which has been is what will be, and that which is done, what will be done. May I say this, that history repeats itself. There is nothing new under the sun. The preacher continues on here, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see this is new? Just as Israel turned its back on God, we see this nation today turning its back on God by introducing lawlessness, by proclaiming lawless deeds. Today, we have prophecy being fulfilled where good is called evil and evil is called good. You know, in Proverbs, it says that he who justifies the wicked and condemns the just, both are alike an abomination to the Lord. I have to ask you, where is your stance? Do you trust in God? 
Do you trust in his word? Do you follow after him? Let's uh, continue on so I can finish this up. Verse 10. Is there anything of which it may be said, see this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. We see in his word here in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9 and 10. There is no remembrance of the formal things, nor will there be any remembrance of the things that are to come. So whatever we know in this life, it's not going to matter. Unless it has to do with God, His Word, and what He's working through us. There may be nothing new under the sun, but thankfully the followers of Jesus Christ, those who are born again by God's Spirit, they don't live under the sun in that sense. Their life is filled with new things. Let's talk about this. See what it says. For those who are in pursuit of money, I'm going to give you an example of this. 1 Timothy 6.10 has this to say, this is opposite of the believer, but instead represents those who are pursuing things that are considered vanity. It is pointless, does nothing for your soul, and it is contrary to it. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many arrows. That goes towards those who even believe that they are in Christ, that may be under the false prosperity doctrine that believes that we are to live our best life now, just as much as it is towards the world. Now for believers, this is the relationship, this is the identity that we have. I'm going to name them off right now. It says this, that we are given a new name. Isaiah 62.2 says the Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Revelation 2.17 says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And it will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name, written which no one except him who receives it will know. We also will be brought into a new community. Ephesians 2.14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So there's no longer any separation between us and God between us and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow believers. We also see in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Spirit is the Holy Spirit. We have a new help from angels in Psalm 91, 11. It says, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. We have a new commandment in John 13, 34. Jesus says this, a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. Jesus Christ was that example. He loved us and so therefore we ought to be demonstrating that love if Jesus Christ is truly in our lives. We have a new commandment, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38 through 40 says this, They shall be my people and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We are given a new and living way. Hebrews 10, 20 says, By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We're no longer walking in the ways of the world, right? No longer walking according to our own will. 
We're also given a new purity here. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. We are no longer living in accordance to the old covenant. We have a new covenant. That new covenant was purchased for us by the blood of Christ. It is through him that we have and are able to enter into this new covenant. There's a new purity as well. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. There's a lot to speak on this, but for time's sake, we'll stick with this. I want you guys to hear this. Purge out therefore the old leaven, uh, that ye may be a new lump, which I've already read, and ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. I'm repeating this because of the importance. There's a new nature as well. Ephesians 4.24 says this, and that ye may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All right, our faith identifies us with Christ and is outworking through us what is working and pleasing to him, brings those good works that please him. We will be indeed walking in holiness as well. We also are a new creation. So we have to understand these characteristics for those who are truly believers in Christ, those who truly will represent Christ, who have died to themselves and have been made anew. All things become new. Revelation 2, I'm sorry, Revelation 21, 5 says this, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Amen. Listen. There is a cure for worldliness. Don't pass this by. I said this before at the beginning. That life is but a vapor. It passes away. We are like a wisp of smoke. The flowers in the valley, they fade. They're here one day and they're gone the next. So too is your life. If you do not heed these instructions, if you do not repent and believe and trust in Jesus Christ, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I have to give the bad with the good. I've got to present to you the whole gospel, not just part of it. The cure to worldliness is this. We find it in James 4, verses 7 through 10. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let the laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If we think that we don't need to hear this message, if we think that we don't need Jesus Christ, then we've rejected God's only sacrifice. There will be no other way. There is no other chance. Finally, I'm going to finish with this. Last few couple things here. Matthew 10, 22 says this. For those who will stand for God. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Mark 13, 13 says. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake as well. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. I'm sorry. I think I uh, need to correct that. Mark 13, 13. That um, is not quite accurate. We'll need to uh, get that pulled up. Revelation 2.11 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. You guys understand that? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Ecclesiastes 12.13 instructs us this way let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter 
fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You can cast your burdens upon Jesus, for his burden is, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he calls everyone here to come to him and do just that. And this last passage I'm going to read, I'm going to finish up with this. It's found in Revelation. I want to invite you to hear what the Lord is speaking to John as he's having his vision. Found in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. It's a beautiful passage, and it gives us all hope. That is this. This is what the Lord says. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying this, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Hallelujah. I look forward to that day, the day when there was no more pain, the day when there was no more suffering, the day when God's grace, his mercy comes to completion in our lives. He continues on to say this, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, nor, I'm sorry, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When these formal things pass away, there is no more death, no more pain. Verse 5, then he who sat on the throne said this, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. The Lord says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water, of life freely to him who thirsts. If you thirst for that fountain, he will give it to you. But you must deny yourself. Come after him. Deny yourself. Put down your ways. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Trust in God. He is the beginning and the end. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And God says that he will be our God. And then he says of us, we shall be his son. Amen. Glory to God. If anyone wants any prayers, please come over. We invite you to come over here. Hear the gospel if you've not heard it. Or if you think you understand it. And maybe things aren't working out quite just right in your life. Or if you are a believer and you are walking in faith and obedience to God. Come and have fellowship. If anyone needs prayer, we're here for you. We love you. We're here to proclaim to you the message of the gospel of peace. God bless you all. And I'm going to hand this off to my brothers now. Test, test, test. Praise God, praise God. I wanted to continue talking a little bit further. My brother Michael said about the book of Ecclesiastes. For those who may not be familiar, this is one of the wisdom books in the Bible. It is also one of the most cynical books in the Bible, but it offers hope in the end. The main theme in the Bible, and or the main theme in the book of Ecclesiastes, is that everything is vanity under the sun. This is what it says in the King James and other versions. It uses the word meaningless. And then in the Hebrew, the word is hevel, meaning simply like a vapor that is there for a moment and vanishes. This is the main message in the book of Ecclesiastes. And this is said by, reportedly said by Solomon, the most wise man in the ancient world. He sought to live his life, to find value in it. He first started out looking after 
wisdom. And through all his searching, all his reading of the, the ancient books and trying to get wiser in his ways, he came down to a harsh reality that whether you were a wise man or a fool, your fate was the same. That fate being death. And as such, even if you spent your whole life trying to gain the wisdom of the world or whether you neglected it your whole life, in the end it would amount to nothing that it would be ultimately meaningless. And so that disturbed his soul. He then went forward looking into after pleasure, seeking out the pleasures in the world, seeing that it was good to, to eat, to drink, and enjoy your life. He even talked about how that we all have a lot in life and that we have that lot and we should enjoy the things that are given to us. We should not resent those who may be wealthier than us. We should enjoy our state in life. But what he found is all the people who pursue all the different pleasures in the world, all the wine, all the drink, the more carnal things in the world, it all amounted to little. We see examples through that in our lives. We see this examples that goes on in our culture, our, our hookup culture, or the, the cheating culture that goes on, where people feel neglected. We have certain women who feel they deserve more, so in a moment in time they will, they will cheat on their man and ultimately will bring down their house by their choices that they make. They will have great, great regret in the future, but the message still is even if you chase after all the pleasures that the world offers you, it ultimately means nothing. It means nothing, and the reason is because you will die, you will pass away, and the things that you've done will vanish. They will not remember your name. This is why it also, even if you chase after achievement, if you try to build big buildings or big build businesses, or give a name a celebrity or status where people in your time know your name. There will come a time in the future where you will be forgotten just as the names in the past. And so whether you were successful or you're not will ultimately not matter. For the Bible says it doesn't matter whether you gather stones or you scatter them. The result is all the same. And then Solomon continued on. He started to look after money. Many people seek after money in this world. I did for a lot of my life. But the Bible or the trouble says that those who seek after money, there is no rest, even when they have abundance. For there's that fear that they will lose it. They have that fear that it will be taken away from them. And so that's the challenge that people deal with. When they get possessed by money, it becomes their ruler. They become a slave of bondage to it. And these are the things that Solomon was troubled by. It troubled his mind that going after each of these paths, as people do, and they found in the end that it was vanity, it was meaningless. They could give their whole lives to these things. It would all be for naught because in the end, they would die and it would all pass from them. And that's why my brother said at the end, but the ray of hope in the wisdom book of Ecclesiastes, as my brother said, is at the very end of the book. It says, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is man's all. For he will bring everything, including every hidden thing, into judgment, whether it be good or evil. For the reality is, the true value is, we are living in God's world. He is the one that created the heavens, the earth, and the stars. He is the one that has given you life. He's given you breath. He's given you a hope in His Son, the better hope, as it says in the Bible, the hopes that you will receive His word, that you will fear Him. You will not be taken in the false songs of the world, the distractions, taken in by man's wisdom which is folly ultimately, taken in by the pleasures of the world that are short-term pleasures that will pass away and not sustain, not sustain like having a relationship with the Almighty Father, not 
counting yourselves up in your own pride if you chased after achievement or purpose thinking if you build something that you will become important all those things can be torn down the greatest monuments can and have been torn down throughout history they will not last your name will be erased from the books and then your money you cannot take your money with you as it says you can spend all your days and all your time toiling to get a bunch of money and then you can pass it on to the next generation that can squander it all for naught so that's why solomon says in the end fear god and keep his commandments for in the end that is the ultimate message that we should all hearken to that is the message that offers change and so that is the alarming message but the other message is it's true that god is a god of love god is a god that wants to have a personal relationship with you and that's an amazing thing considering the billions of people on this earth and throughout history and yet there is a god that loved you enough to give you life the bible says that he knows the number of hairs on your head and that might seem impossible to you as a finite being but never forget the things that are impossible to man are possible with god and god calls out to you he calls out to you in his word he calls out to you in gospel tracts. He calls out to you in street preachers in the hopes you will receive his message, in the hopes that you will change your ways, in the hopes that you will recognize that your life is not your own, but you live for God, for he gave you all. For you have but a short life. The Bible says, what is your life but a vapor that appeareth for a moment in time and vanishes? So many people, especially young people, think they're invincible and think they'll have plenty of days to get right with God. But be not deceived. Your life is fragile. So many people die from car accidents or illnesses, unexpected illnesses, or worse, drug overdoses. They think they'll have more time to get right. They think they'll be in a better position later after they have achieved whatever they're seeking. But for so many, that time runs out on them, or they've hardened their hearts so much down the road that they no longer want to. And that's why the Bible says God gives you a way to your sins, ultimately, if you are not repentant. And that's why there's an urgency in my voice, a hope that you will receive the word. If you have not thought about God, please let this be the day that you do. Please let this be the day that you let that thought linger in your mind and you take it with you. For there are many things here tonight to distract you. You have the country music you had earlier. You had a, a cow rally. You'll have honking horns. You'll have music from the cars. But all those things will pass away. They're ultimately meaningless. And your life is ultimately meaningless without God. Please, for the love of God, humble yourself. Please, for the love of God, don't puff yourself up with pride. I say this from my own past and my own ways. I know that can be difficult where you want to do things your own way. You want to trust in your own wisdom, but your own wisdom will ultimately fail you. Your own wisdom will ultimately let you down. Whereas it says in John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Many people make a mock of the gospel message. They don't understand the true sacrifice. I think it was too far in the past, 2,000 years ago. It does not apply to me. But the sacrifice made by Christ was just as real today as it was then. And so remember that message. Remember that sacrifice in love. There was a story I was told by a, a pastor in the UK called Joe Kirby. I'd like to share it with all of you. There's a story about a young girl and her mother, and her mother and her mother had disfigured, mangled hands. 
But her mother loved her daughter, and her mother would take the daughter to school every day without fail to school. But unfortunately, other kids would see the mother, and they see her hands, and they would make fun of her. And this would happen day after day. And so the young daughter was upset, as kids do, and ultimately, in, a, in lashing out, screamed at her mother, I hate you, I hate your hands, and she ran off to her room. But her father saw this go on, so the father came to console and talk to her, talk to her daughter. And he said, honey, your, your mother loves you very much, and I'm going to tell you why. When you were a little girl, and your mother was outside at the outside of the house and she and you were up on the second story of the house and there was a fire and the mother couldn't get into the house through the stairs and the house she climbed up the side of the railing and there was a metal railing and each time she put her hand on the metal railing she burned her hands but she would not stop out of love for you and so she kept climbing step after step until she finally got to you and wrapped you in a blanket and took you out of the house. That was the love your mother had for you. And of course, the little daughter heard this, heard this message, and all she could do is run to her mother and kiss her hands because she loved the sacrifice that the mother had given for her. And so just like Christ, when Christ's hands were nailed and he was bloodied and he was whipped over 39 times by the cat of nine tails where he struggled up the dusty road to the, the hill of Calvary all that sacrifice all that pain that was for you that was for you so even if you don't appreciate the stern message even if you don't appreciate the warning know that there was a God that loved you enough to take on your sin the Bible says that he loved us even while we were still sinners even while we were in rebellion to God and you have the opportunity you have the opportunity to receive that gift of grace and mercy even today, you can be covered by the blood of Christ. Even today, you can become changed. Even if you made a mess of your life for years, even if you've been a drunk, even if you've been an adulterer, even if you've been a drug addict, all those things can pass away. You can become a new creation in Christ. And that can happen today. That can happen to you. That can happen to you today in a moment in time. You can be forever changed. You can be washed and covered by the blood of Christ. You can be forgiven of the things you've done, the things you're ashamed of, and you can walk a new path. You can cast aside the old man, and you can walk anew. And that is the beauty of the gospel message that there's a God that loved you enough to allow you to come clean. To wash away the wickedness and to be cloaked in his righteousness and never be the same again. May those words stick with you tonight. Above all the distractions here, may those words prick your heart. May cause you to think about them not just today and tomorrow, but the rest of the month and on into the months to follow. May you be changed. May you be moved. And don't be concerned about what your friends think. Don't be concerned about what your parents think. Be more concerned about what God thinks. Be more concerned about what God thinks about your life. Let this be your Independence Day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And this could be your day of salvation. This could be your day that you walk in righteousness and you walk with your God. May that be all of you. May that be you. If you have questions, we're going to be here all night. So please come to us. We'll do our best to answer them. God bless you all. Check. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My friends, what does it profit a man if he shall gain the world and let lose his own soul? What is the point in seeking the world and its desires when they're all going to fade away one day? It's foolishness to have loads of money in your pockets but your soul is empty. You gain nothing from this world. This world is going to pass away one day and so will you. But my friends, through Christ you can have eternal life. Jesus says that he is the way and the truth and he is the life and that no man can come to the Father except through Christ. The Bible will say, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast demons out in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And the Lord will declare to that person, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. My friends, being a Christian is not about living a double lifestyle. Going to church every Sunday is, will not save you. Only Jesus, my friends, can save you from death. And how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you have eternal security? God has changed you and he's crucifying the flesh every single day. Jesus says to deny yourself and to pick up your cross and to follow him daily. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. In other words, your good works will not save you. Your good does not outweigh your bad because that would be an unrighteous judge. Your good deeds do not save you. If you're in a court of law and you're charged with, a, with murder and you tell the judge, well, judge, what about all the good things that I've done in my life? The judge is going to look at you and say, I don't care what you've done in, in your life. You've broken the law. You've earned the death sentence. And it's the same with Christ. Because he is a perfect and holy judge, we will all be held accountable for the sins that we have committed. And the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. But we have to deny ourselves. We have to turn from the ways of the world. And we have to put our trust in Christ and in Christ alone. This world will not save you. A perishing world is not going to save you. Jesus says that today is the day of salvation. In other words, you don't know when you're going to die. As Brother John spoke earlier, many people think that they're invincible. People act like they will live forever. But one day we are all going to pass and death is proof that God is serious of sin. God has put us on death row. He has put us on death row because of our sins. But through Christ is eternal life. And many people will say, oh, well, I don't believe in that. Oh, well, how convenient is that for you? How convenient is that for you? It's easy to say that you don't believe in God when you're not, you're not there with him face to face. But there will be a day when that comes. And you'll regret every single thing that you said. It's easy to reject someone that you can't see. But my friends, the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the only way and the truth and the life. I want to encourage you guys to stop seeking after the world. It is foolishness to seek after something that is perishing. Seek for what is eternal, my friends which is in Christ Jesus, because it could be either a billion years in hell and it has just begun, or it could be a billion years in heaven and it has just begun. But that is your choice, my friends. It is your choice to cry out to God right now.
put your trust in him. And many of you guys are scoffers and mockers, and that's just because you guys are content with what you have right now. But once you guys lose everything that you have, you will not be mocking the God that created you. You will not be mocking, you'll be crying out to him on that day of judgment, but it will be too late then. But we love you guys enough to tell you to turn now while you still can. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you still have time to turn to the Lord today. Today is the day of salvation. It is easy to reject God when you know you're guilty. It is easy to reject God when you don't see him face to face right now. But one day you will. One day you'll stand before him. And you can be prideful all you want. But everything that you have is from God. Right now we're borrowing from God. Do not be deceived. Because right now we are borrowing from God. You will not have the things that you have forever. And the reason why people reject this message is because they are guilty. We are all guilty, my friends. We are no better than you. But if you die without Christ as your Savior and Lord, you will perish, my friends. And we don't want that for you. Neither does God. We good? It is not God's desire that any should perish, but all to have life. Eternal life. But because of our stubbornness, because of our pride, we choose to reject God. Because of the nice cars that we have, those loud cars won't save you, the music won't save you, all the attention that you get won't save you. But it will pass one day. This day will pass one day. There is more to life than what you see right now. There is eternal life, and where will you spend an eternity? Will, he, will Jesus say, depart from me, I never knew you? Or well done, my faithful servant. And many of you guys sitting here and walking by us today are reconsidering your thoughts and your actions. Do not be ashamed, because this may be your last chance. Do not be embarrassed or ashamed of the gospel message. Because if you're ashamed, he will reject you. Turn to the Lord while you still can. Cry out to him while you still can. Cry out to, to Christ Jesus who died on a cross for you. My friends, being a Christian, you cannot live a double lifestyle. It's not about living a double lifestyle, my friends. It's not a cultural uh, go to church every Sunday and, and get drunk the next six days and to live in sin and to do all kind of sinful deeds. My friends, being a Christian is about denying yourself, turning to Christ, following the narrow gates. Don't be a hypocrite. Turn from your sins and put your trust in the Lord while he can still be found. And those same mockers that mock Christ will be the same ones that will bow in front of Christ and cry out to Christ when it will be too late. As I said earlier, it'll be easy to reject God while you don't see him face to face. It is easy to reject someone. It is easy to reject uh, God while you don't see him face to face. That's easy. Anybody could do that. Be humble, my friends. Submit to God. We're all bad. None of us are good. Only God is good. You need to clean. No. You gotta turn from your sins. You gotta turn from your sins or you will perish, my friends. Again, hypocrisy. Does God love us? Yes. But there will be a day when he will give you no more time. Again, as I said earlier, just as a proof of that right there, 
It's easy to reject God. It's easy to live a lifestyle however we want to because we think God's going to let us slide or whatever it may be. He already did that on the cross. Now it's up to us to turn to Christ, to put to death ourselves and to follow him just as he did on the cross, my friends. Stop playing the hypocrite. And the reason why people get so angry is because they feel conviction. Because they know that they're not good people, as that woman just stated. None of us are good. I'm not good. Nobody is good. The Bible says that the heart is the most desperate amongst all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? But my friends, through Christ, you can have life, eternal life. And you, have, you, and you may have heard this message a billion times before. And you may think, why do I have to keep listening to this message? Because you're not doing it. Because you're not surrendering to the Lord. You're not turning from your sins and putting your trust in Christ. Most people in the churches today will perish. Going to church every Sunday does not save you. Many people see this as just a cultural thing to, go, to get drunk and to live in fornication and adultery on, on Saturday night. Then to clean themselves up. To clean themselves up. Then act like nothing ever happened and act like this goody tissue in church. But my friends, God is not deceived. For you are deceived. Thinking that you can trick God into thinking that you can get away from the sins and from the actions you've committed. It's easy to reject God right now. It's easy to turn from your sins right now because you feel invincible, but you're not invincible and you'll die one day. You will perish and you will stand before God, the perfect and holy God. And you will stand before him, and it will be too late. Now you may not like this message, but we love you enough to tell you the truth of the message, so that in the hopes that you may turn from your ways, turn from your pridefulness, because we're all going to die one day. Turn from your ways, turn from the things of this world, and put your trust into the Lord. Because we will die one day. It's time to humble ourselves, my friends. It's easy to reject God right now when you have everything you need, but one day you're going to lose it, man. One day you're going to lose it. God is serious about sin because he has given us the death sentence. Death is not normal, my friends. But because of sin, God has put us on death row. But even though we're put on death row, God has made a way. Jesus suffered and died on the cross for your sins, and God poured out his wrath so that you wouldn't have to experience it. But if you don't turn to the Lord now, you will experience his wrath and his judgment. And that is something to be afraid of, my friends. If you're not afraid, you should be. You should be afraid, my friends. If you haven't surrendered to Christ and if you don't have any sorrowfulness towards your sin, you should be afraid. Because every time we sin, we store up his wrath. But because of Christ, we can be forgiven. But we have to turn from our ways. If you're in a relation, in a marriage, you don't cheat on your wife and, and say, Oh, I'm sorry, honey, I'll never do it again, then continue to do it again. No, you turn from it. That's called fake repentance. That's called false conversion. You must turn to him today, my friends. Turn to him while you still can. My friends, creation is proof of a creator. It is scientifically impossible that nothing created everything. Zero plus zero does not equal one. And why is it wrong to murder if there is no God? Why is it wrong to lie and to cheat and to steal if there is no God? But my friends, God has placed his moral laws in our hearts. 
so that we know what is wrong and what is right. But because of our wickedness, right has uh, wrong is become right, and right has become wrong because of our wickedness, because of man's sinful nature. But turn to the Lord while you still can, so He can show you the truth of the world, show you the truth of His love and His mercy. For it is not of your works, but it's Christ who works in you. It's Christ who changes you and you'll never be the same again. He'll renew your mind, remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And he'll put a spirit inside you and you'll never be the same again. You'll always be content, my friends, because you'll no longer be following the world and the courses of this world. There is more to life than to live in sin and to get drunk and to sleep with as many as people as you want. That is not what life is about. It is about surrendering. It is about, about our free will choice to turn to the Lord while we can. And many people say, well, why is there so much evil in this world? It's because we reject God and His law. God's law was to keep holiness and peace. That's what His law is for. But that same person that claims, that make, that ask the question, why is there evil, is that same person that's causing the evil in the world. If you, many people talk about making the world a better place. We need to make the world a better place. No, you want control. You want your ways. That's what you really want. But my friends, the reality is there will be no peace in this earth, in this world. For the Bible tells us so. But God will destroy this earth one day eventually. And make it perfect as it was supposed to be. But you can only experience that perfect heaven and perfect earth if you turn to the Lord right now. Don't ignore His voice that you're hearing today. Don't continue in the courses of the life of this world but turn to the true and living King. God of all gods, there is only one God. His name is Christ Jesus. And there are no other gods. All those, all those other gods, they're all dead. All those false prophets, they're all dead. But Jesus Christ raised from the dead and defeated death. He defeated death so that we can have eternal life. He lived a perfect and sinless life because He's God. Only God can live a perfect and sinless life. Only God can forgive sin. And that's Christ Jesus, my friends. He is God. He is life. He is the resurrection, my friends. But we must humble ourselves and turn to Him. We must turn from our ways. And we must take our sins and nail it on the cross. Jesus says, if you belong to him, you have taken your sins and you have nailed it onto the cross. Have you nailed your sins to the cross? Or are you living in hypocrisy? A double lifestyle that you know that God does not approve of. My friends, yes, God is love, but he does hate too. Because he's a righteous judge. He hates sin. He hates wickedness. But in His mercy, He gave you life so that you can receive eternal life. So I want to encourage you guys to turn to the cross today. Turn to Christ Jesus now while you still can, for today is the day of salvation. 150,000 people die every single day. Who's to say that it's not you? You're not invincible. You won't live forever. We're all... As soon as we're born, we're dying. Our life is like an hourglass. As soon as we're born, we're running out of time. And that time could be cut short. And even if it's not cut short, we have 60 to 80 years at best of this life. And most of us are in our 20s and up. That's gone very quickly, hasn't it? My friends, we're going to pass one day. Death is ceasing upon us one day, and it's ceasing upon us when we're first born. We're not invincible. 
Turn from your sins today. Put your trust into the eternal one, the resurrection, the life who is in Christ Jesus. Humble yourselves. Don't seek the world for attention or pleasure when this world is going to fade away one day. Turn to the cross, my friends. Turn to him while you still can. If you have any questions, come see us. Come talk to us because we want you to receive the mercy and the grace and the perfect love that God has. Not the love of the world. Not the love that the world gives you, but the love that God gives you. Which is in Christ Jesus and only found in Christ Jesus, my friends. Turn from your ways. Put your trust in Him while you still can. Before it's too late. We're only going to be here for a short, short amount of time. This is your chance to turn to the Lord while you still can. It may be your only... It may be your only chance. God knows when we're going to die. God only knows when we're going to die. We have an appointment with death one day. And that appointment with death could be tomorrow. It could be today. Death is not something to celebrate. Hell is a real place, my friends. It is not a party, my friends. It is... Hell is a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and a lake of fire that burns forever, that is not quenched. You will not have a glass of water. You will not see your family or your friends or the good things that you have right now. So I want to encourage you guys to seek to the Lord while you still, while you still can. Turn to Him while you still can so that you can have eternal life. Because all the things that we have, we're going to pass one day. They're all going to pass one day, my friends. But through Christ is eternal life. Through Christ is salvation, eternal security. But evidence that you're saved is that God is transforming your life daily. You're crucifying the flesh daily. You're dying to this world daily. And putting your trust into the Lord like you would trust a parachute. You don't just acknowledge a parachute to save your life. That's not going to work. But you put your trust into the parachute to save your life. And that's what, it's the same way with Christ Jesus. And we distract ourselves by the courses of the world to ignore the fact that death is going to cease upon us one day. We distract our, ourselves with the ways of the world to ignore that death will cease upon us one day. But you can ignore it all you want. Because 10 out of 10 people die. That's everybody. We're all going to die. And we're all going to have to stand before Him. So I want to encourage you guys to turn to the cross while you still can. Turn to Him. Cry out to Him. And many of you guys are listening to this message and reconsidering your life. Don't ignore God's voice that you're hearing right now. Turn to Him while you still can. Because we do not want you to perish and neither does God. But because He gave you free will, you have that choice to choose God or to reject God. And because men reject God, this is what happens to the world. Because men reject God, that is why you see chaos every single day. Because we reject God, that is why you see destruction in this world today. Because we reject God, and, the Bible, and this world tells you to follow your heart, but the Bible says that the heart is the most deceitful above all things. But through Christ is life. You can have eternal life today. Don't ignore Him today. Cry out to Him. Trust in Christ and not yourself, for whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So turn to Him today. Turn to Christ today while you still can, my friends. Don't ignore His voice. Repent from your sins. Turn from your sins. 
put your trust into the Lord. My friends, if you're walking like the world, talking like the world, and acting like the world, you are not saved. For many will say, Lord, Lord, on that day, and he'll declare, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. My friends, don't seek men for answers. Seek Christ Jesus. And many people make the statement of, oh, well, I don't believe in a book that was written over 2,000 years. You believe in the same thing. You believe in science written by men and textbooks. You read a science textbook and you say, oh, this has to be true. But scientists fail all the time. They change their conclusions every, every couple of years. And they tell you all that stuff is wrong. We're all doing it the wrong way. If this is the right way. Then many years later, it is the same way. It is the same exact thing over and over. But Christ's word has remained and it is stead firm on the truth and it has not changed. And how do you know that God's word is true through prophecy fulfillment, that God has prophesied things of the earth that has come and will come soon? For an example, the nation of Israel the Bible prophesied thousands of years ago that nation would become an Israel, uh, that Israel would become a nation again one day, and in and in 1948, nation sure enough, the nation of Israel sure enough became a nation once again, and that's just one of many prophecy fulfillments, my friends. Another example of proof of God's word is his moral law written in your hearts. He has written our moral law in our hearts and men are prideful and they hate God because the Bible says they hate God without a cause. And they yell and curse God. They're not cursing us, they're cursing God Almighty. That's who they're cursing. They're cursing God and rejecting God. But we will stand before him one day we will stand before him one day and you will bow down and you will confess him as Lord. But do that now while you can still have mercy. Bow down and cry out to the Lord while you still have mercy. Don't do it before it is too late. Cry out to him now, my friends. Don't play the hypocrite, my friends, and say you're a Christian but you get drunk and hook up with random people on, on the weekends or whenever you do. God hates sin, and every time we sin, He restore up His wrath. But even though we cannot keep His law, we cannot obey it, through the power of His Spirit, He will change you, and you'll never be the same again. So I want to encourage you guys to turn to Him while you still can. The Catholic Church will not save you. The priest does not save you. The Bible says that there is one mediator between God and man, and his name is Christ Jesus. You cannot go through a sinful man for your forgiveness. That is ridiculous. Nowhere in that is in the Bible. Only Christ Jesus, my friends, can save you.